So yeah, welcome. Uh, I, I thought we'd do a little introduction first before I get started. So my name is Florian Füsslin. I'm audio director here at Crytek. Uh, I'm with the company for f almost 14 years now um, and been working on all CryEngine versions except CryEngine 1 that already existed when I started. All right. So let's do a little detour about you know, what audio basically is from a game perspective. So usually um, you're all familiar with linear audio, right? That's music, that's movie. So something you p press play and it will play until the end and then it will stop. And then you play again and it will start from the beginning and play all the way through until the end again, right? So that's what we're all familiar with. And that's pretty simple because if you, let's say, have this screenshot taken from Hunt Showdown, you know, and, and you imagine that scene, how would that play out? If you think of a movie, you would hear, let's say, the birds and the wind and like, whoo. and then the situation is like an ambush, right? So you would maybe start hearing the guys from the very distant, like, oh my God, my lunch yesterday was not very good. And then they're getting closer and you slowly hear like the footsteps and then everybody would very quietly reload the weapon and get ready. And of course the music would start dum 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 and would build up at the perfect moment where most likely it's like over there bam 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 and then both dead birds fly off and then it would quieten down again, right? So you have pretty much a curve which is like up and down, like perfectly tailored emotional sensation from an audio perspective. Yeah, and that's what you do in linear, you're thinking in scenes. If we talk music, you have like beginning, first chorus, first verse, bridge, right? So it's all structured. If you talk in movies, you have, I don't know, real one, real two, scene one, scene two. It's all perfectly tailored. Now in interactive media, we have a bit of a problem because we have the player, or in your case, the user inputting to that system constantly, in every millisecond, every frame, there's an input from the user. And we don't know what the user is supposed to do or what he's actually, well, we're trying to make him do something, but he can do whatever. So this very same scene looks therefore more like this. We have all these different sounds placed in the scene, but now we've got a problem, which is <laughs> this very same scene, which perfectly was you know, really emotional before, could play out like this. We're sitting there, I'm the guy in the front, there's my partner behind, behind the, that wheel. And then we hear the guys coming, they're talking about, oh, my food was so bad yesterday. And they're getting closer and they're getting closer. And then they turn around and we'll run away. So my music is already like, dum, 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 starting, but then nothing happens, right? So it's like, yeah, nothing happens. Or the other way around, like they just come closer, we're reloading the gun, we're about to shoot. And they just saw us and like, doo, doo, headshot, headshot. And like, oh, okay, that's it. Or my buddy up front is like, He's suddenly doing this, <laughs> network stuck. And it's like, oh my God, he's, he's offline, oh my God. Or, or he will just say like, no mom, I cannot bring out the trash. <laughs> so it's like, Ugh! and my music was building up perfectly. It's like, God, no. So that's a little bit the problem we have because we cannot predict what the user can do. So, but that means we have to think in sources, right? So instead of saying we do one audio mix where we also know exactly like we want to hear that, we want to hear that, it can happen that every single sound is the very most important in that scene, right? Maybe even that tree, if it's like doing this, it could be the only sound you hear in that scene, right? Uh, the same with the gun, of course. So what game audio usually is, is that we have all these sounds presented and in the scene and mix it in real time to get to this emotional moment. And there are some tricks you can do to get closer to that ideal linear scenario. But yeah, you have to really think about everything could make a sound. And every sound could be the most important in that particular scene. Because if nothing happens and the player reloads, then what you hear is like, <coughs> you want to hear exactly those sounds. While in other scenarios, when there's all, you know, gunfire all over the place, you might not even hear it. We pass it good. So you have to think in sources if you go into interactive media and games. And then we have this, because as we constantly have input from the player, you can also see what these inputs could be. I just put up a random stuff, just brainstormed in my mind. Not all of these parameters are constantly present in a game, but very obviously distance, right? You have a sound, you have a source, and as you go further away from it, you want that it gets quieter, that it changes the color of the sound. So, right, it gets more muffled, closer, like it changes their, their, their frequency spectrum. So that's a very obvious one. Then positioning, right, it's like, if the sound comes from the TV and I'm looking at it, then it's from the front. If I turn to the left, then it should stay there and therefore position correctly. 
Um, that's the basic stuff we have. But then it goes further, right? Listener angle, we call, do you look at it? Do you look away from it, right? So we could, we could do the classy we do with waterfalls. Waterfall, if you look at it, it's very detailed and really loud. If you look away, it's more like it muffles, so it's not in the way in the mix. Or, you know, team fraction, we could have like, am I, am I the player team, am I the enemy team? or team A, team B, team blue, team red. You could have different sounds based on that. Time of day, very obvious, like if it's night, it sounds different than during the day. Wind intensity, movement speed, surface type, boot type, um, equipment type. You know, you can, you can read it pretty much. It's like endless amount of things you could ask the game for, right? And that's what we constantly do to change the sound in real time. Because we first have to think in conditions, like am, am I the player? If I'm the player, then play this sound. If I'm not the player, if I'm an enemy player, play maybe another sound. And then this is an example how this plays out in Hunt. In that case, with draw debug on, which is our uh, S underscore audio, audio draw debug, which is showing parameters and triggers in real time and how they update. And there's a little video. So you saw that guy walking down there and you see that the distance is constantly updating and I could, I could add more to that debug draw to see all the parameters the guy's using, like speed, which surface type, etc, etc. So therefore, um, as we have to think in, in conditions and also sources, then this is very important that we go in and say wherever that sound is coming from, we want to place it exactly there, right? So for example, well in this case it's a human, you could argue that we could all play from the center would probably be okay. But imagine you have a dinosaur, right, with a left foot and a right foot, and I'm the player in the middle, then obviously I want the left foot to be boom and the right foot to be boom. And then the, right, the roar from the head and all that. So positioning is very important. So we used to do it even on the small stuff. We, we, we do it very precisely because then you have all the options, right? What if it turns fast? Which direction it goes, etc. You have You have more options to work with later. So in the end, you have to think in real time, <laughs> which sounds a bit weird because that's what we always do, but with the conditions, with the positioning and all the options you have, you, you have to make up your mind saying, okay, do I want a static sound or do I want to alter the sound in real time in whatever direction I want? A little bit about audio production. So you also know how we generate assets and how we get to the results. It all starts pretty much here. So ideally, you go out in the woods or on your swimming pool or, yeah, and, uh, and you do real physics stuff. So in that case, on the left, we're doing footsteps. Uh, on the right, there was a preparation for uh, jumping into water and just doing loud water splashes. So that's the best scenario. Very often, you don't have the time or some sometimes it's also difficult. For example, shooting a gun in Germany, not as simple. In America, no problem. Um, <laughs> but if you really like, you wanna do, when you want to do a tank simulation, you might have a hard time saying like, hey US, can I get the M1 Abrams? Yeah, on my courtyard, Tonight, yeah, this afternoon, thank you. So yeah, of course, there are tons of libraries out there where professionals have done that and prepare the sounds perfectly, so you almost can drag and drop it in. Um, but we never do that, but what we do is like this, for example. It's again Dominic hunting ducks and goose. So in the end, regardless whether you have real sources or library, we rarely put stuff in one-to-one. -one. It always goes usually through a, a digital audio workstation. That software is called uh, Nuendo from Steinberg, um, but there's Pro Tools, there are multiple audio softwares out there which can do multi-layering, so you have multiple tracks. They get basically mixed together, so our sounds consist usually of, of different parts and they've been designed and created to our needs. The reason why we use this, well, A, we want to alter the sounds uh, on a regular basis and we want access to all the fancy plugins which are out there. Because the audio middleware, as we're going to talk about, and the cry engine audio system itself is more about how we trigger audio. It's not necessarily about how the audio is being treated in real time. That's all part either of the audio middleware or if it gets more expensive in terms of, um, let's say, you want to have real reverberation or maybe you know, tons of different plugins, it just gets too expensive, so we hard bake that together and use a dedicated software for it. Yeah, that all gets mixed as well. The output we usually do, 
We end up with mono files very often. The reason is with all the virtual reality, the positioning of the sound is a point source, right? So if my TV does a sound, then I would just put the sound here. And we can alter in real time how this mono source kind of spreads and gets bigger. So we don't need to bounce a 7-1 channel thing. So this is something more we do for movies, but not so much in games. So our source is usually mono or stereo most of the time. Then the next step, this is uh, what, we, what you're going to see a little more today. We end up our assets being transported into a so-called audio middleware. Audio middleware is a dedicated software which was designed for game audio. Best example is we don't want to be repetitive. The human ear is very receptive to repetition. So if you have a door sound which opens like the and you hear the exact same sound again, then you kind of, oh, I heard that one. So what we want is like we want the same door opening but ever so slightly different, right? So like a and the next sound is so it's clearly a different sound. And what these type of audio middleware can, for example, is very simple, as you can see here already. You have a pistol fire, but you can have multiple variations, right? So you don't need to do a complex logic in a, I don't know, flow graph or somewhere where you say, if it sounds come in, then decide A, B, C, D, that does it out of the box. Or parameters you're going to see as well. It's very easy to adjust the curve, how the sound should behave over distance. So everything which is not as easy in a linear audio workstation, like the software slides I showed before, is something which comes out of the box here and makes our life a lot easier. And in the end, of course, speeds up our workflow. Another software uh, is so-called Audio Kinetic Wise. Thomas will talk about that a bit more. But the good thing about CryEngine, it is agnostic. So you are free in the use of the audio middleware. So that's a very uh, big advantage because you can basically swap even in real time between different scenarios if you, if you dare to. Yeah, and then from there, we have it prepped in the audio middleware. Uh, an audio middleware usually has a build process. Uh, it's basically it's compiling their own audio data to make it data driven and ready for the CryEngine to use. And in CryEngine itself, we spend time in the sandbox to place the audio where we want it. So for example, we draw shapes where we say, hey, this house has this shape, so when you go inside, then this sound plays, or that reverb happens. Um, or as you can see here, if that's the windmill, we place a sound here, so we have the coming from that position. So if I'm walking down here, I'm going to hear it from above. So that's where we spend a lot of time in the sandbox editor. Of course, there are dedicated tools um, you might have seen already, like character tool, where you can attach sounds to the movement and can say, if the step happens, then play a footstep or, or a signal, which then triggers the footstep. Track view, particles, for example, come with an audio component. So you can always say, if that particle occurs, play that audio to it. And this is, again, like a little bit debug. This is how it seems to look. But then again, if you put audio debug on, you see how much sound there's actually playing, right? There's so many triggers all over the place. So again, here in a static faction, might, might look like nothing's going on. Oops, in fact, there's a lot of things in that scene. Not all audio related, but many can be. Yeah, that brings me to my last one. So the design concept also on CryEngine from, from the an audio designer perspective is that they want to be as iterative as possible. So you saw that we have a recording or a library sound or some asset you've designed. It's going to be edited and then implemented into the audio middleware and in the CryEngine as well. And then we have a verification because everybody knows bugs. Things break, things go lost. And once we have the verification or also like iterative step, we want to we maybe want to say, oh, wait a minute, that sound wasn't good at all, or it didn't work. Then either we record again, or we edit again, and or we just go back to implementation and say, oh, it's too quiet, too loud. And that's another advantage about the audio middlewares. You can connect them in real time to the game engine. So CryEngine can connect directly with them. So you can have you know, one screen, you have Sandbox open. On the other screen, you have your audio middleware open. And you can mix in real time, and you can change things. And that's also something which is very useful because real time always means like you're super fast, you can iterate on it directly, you can really try out things, and that makes it worthwhile. Questions? You have to fake it by rebuilding it. So the, the sources and the recordings you want to end up with are usually pretty dry because we don't know where we're going to use it, right? If I have a clap, maybe I'm in a big hall, maybe I'm in a tunnel, maybe I'm in a small house, so the clap. 
I don't want to have any reverb on that clap because it will be generated in real time. And then the next step is, that was pretty much that part as well, I will draw areas to define which reverb is supposed to play where. And then we have more options to say like wet level, dry level again, so that means Let's say if I, if I go further away from my source sound, then the, the dry signal will get less and the wet signal, so the, the amount of reverb will increase while I go away and I can design that curve. Um, and together with to say, hey, I'm in that room, it has that reverb. If I go further away, then, I don't know, bring up the reverb, make it louder, um, even alter the delay to it. So maybe if I'm close to the wall, it sounds different than further down the hallway. But it's something which is, let's say, not coming out of the box that we just press a button and it automatically generates the room dimension based on the geometry you have around. So that is, that is one thing we recently discussed, which would be fantastic to just say, press a button and then basically the sound knows exactly all the, all the walls. But it's not a trivial thing because are we using meshes? Are we using the actual textures? What happens to the, well, to CryEngine or to game fake, right? Games are often like, like a Western movie, so you have the front, but no back. <laughs> How is my room happening if it's just half a room, etc.? So there are a couple of questions we still have to answer. All right, then I would hand over to Thomas. There you go, sir. So my name is Thomas Wollenzin. I'm the lead audio software engineer here at Crytek. I've been with Crytek for more than 10 years. So who's the programmer here? You might be a bit disappointed because it's really simple stuff. That was really the goal of it as well, to not bother programmers having to worry about audio really. What that means is taking control away, because in the past programmers liked to ask questions like, uh, how do I pause the sound? How do I start the sound? How do I stop the sound? And quite frankly, that's not a worry of a programmer, of a game programmer. That's a worry of a sound designer. They should worry about, should I start a sound here? Do I turn up the volume or not, right? What they need is events and values from the programmers. So the programmer is supposed to inform the sound designer about what's going on. And then they can decide what to do with that information, right? Let's say an explosion happened, right? So the programmer just tells the, basically the sound designer, hey, there was an explosion at that distance, at that time. Oh, by the way, it's raining and there's this going on. And they take that information into the middleware and design a soundscape around that information. And that is uh, possible because of the abstractions that we did. So we redesigned the audio system in CryEngine to be basically abstracted away, right? This is the CryEngine core. In here we have the audio system, which is just a data grinding system. It's really nothing very much audio specific. It's really just taking events and values, transforming it, passing it on, right? Then we have the abstraction layer where all the implementations live for the audio middleware. For instance here, FMOD, SL Mixer, WISE and whatever. And below that, we have the actual middlewares. So these implementations talk directly to the middleware and they get an order from the audio system. So this is here the abstraction in a sense, right? They are translating whatever I'm saying, they are translating it into something that they understand. And the game sit on top of CryEngine, obviously, and they just really don't care about all of that, right? This guy doesn't care about the audio team using Wise, for instance, right? Why should they? Because these guys might decide, you know what? Let's use FMOD. And they say, do I have to change my code now? Luckily not because you don't care about that, right? You just said there's an explosion. And that explosion is handled in Wise on FMOD. That's up to the sound designers. Okay, a few core concepts of the audio system. It's a little bit of text. After that, I think we already go into some uh, code. The importance here was to be able to offer licensees the possibility to use any audio middleware that they want without having to relearn how to code in CryEngine or how to set up designs in the level. Right, so that, that is the abstraction part. We have here those uh, C++ implementations. They serve as a plugin. And uh, currently we support ADX2, FMOD, Mild Sound System, WISE, and SDL Mixer as a cost-free alternative for indie type of studios that don't really want to pay money for a professional audio middleware, right? They don't get awesome sound. They just get some basic sound. Very important 
the Audi system is fully thread safe. You don't need to worry about from what thread you talk to the Audi system. You can send events or commands from any thread to the Audi system. The only thing that you need to keep in mind is the order of events. So you could say, execute that trigger, we get to the trigger part in a second, but execute that trigger at that position. If you do it in the wrong order, let's say you tell it first to execute a trigger and then you reposition the, the audio object, the actual audio middleware could decide to not play the event because the position it's too far away, let's say, right? So you need to say first position it over here and then play the sound. That's a typical error that they sometimes make. It's not a problem if you keep that chain of commands on one thread, then you have your order, right? But you can obviously do it from different threads, but then you have to synchronize yourself. And then very important, that's re really simple, we apply audio functionality either on a global level, like 2D sounds, let's say in a menu, music is global, right? It doesn't have a position, it doesn't really have an owner, it's just there. Or some other event, in the world even, right? It can be anything. And then we have object-specific uh, functionality. Like a footstep, you could say that's an object over there. They are like contexts in a sense. You could say this is a context-driven environment because you want to change, let's take a footstep again, you want to change the way a footstep event sounds depending on the velocity of the character, right? So you could have, let's say, two characters here and one guy is walking slowly and one guy is walking fast. They both play the same event, right? The name is the same. The idea is the same, but this guy is faster, so that guy needs to sound different, right? How do I do it? I can change the parameter on that guy only, and that's the object, right? That other object keeps the original value. So you could technically play a 3D event on a global scale, but that doesn't make any sense, because let's say you could just put an audio object into the scene and play a menu music on it. So you hear the menu music like it's global, but it's on an object, so it's a waste of resource. And the uh, same way around, you can play a 3D event on, on a global scale, but that doesn't make any sense either because it doesn't have a position really, right? So what do I do with the 3D part of it? And then how do we communicate really? And this is what we call the audio controls. They are basically abstractions. They are like events and values. And um, I listed a few here. So we have triggers. Triggers can be used. We call it executing a trigger, just a simple uh, code call. And executing that trigger means really nothing because you don't know what it means. You just tell the system, hey, execute that trigger. And then sound, again, sound designers decide if they want to start a sound using that trigger, if they maybe want to stop a sound using that trigger or whatever. Same thing with uh, parameters, uh, switches. Most uh, popular example is uh, footsteps, right? They're depending on uh, surface types. That's a switch. So the switch name would be surface type. And then they are split into cases like concrete, water, mud, grass, whatever. So you switch between these different states. And that is also used as a means of informing the sound designer, hey, this is your environment that you are in. Do whatever you want with it. So environments, that's what um, Flo talked about a little bit. And you asked the environments are basically those reverbs, right? So you can assign an environment to an uh, audio object and that is then again used by the sound designers to design how the reverberation really sounds. Right? So it's abstract. These guys should just say, hey, you are in a room of type A or you are in a room of type B. And they design how that room really sounds like. And preloads, yeah, that's important. In the cryo engine, mainly out of performance reasons, you can only play sounds if the sounds are preloaded into memory. In the more professional middlewares, that is via sound banks. Very important, uh, control names are unique per type. So these are the types, triggers, parameters, switches. You can have a trigger, let's say, explosion. That's a trigger name. You cannot have another trigger name of the name explosion, but you can have a parameter name that is explosion. But you would probably name this, I don't know, explosion intensity. That would be your parameter that you then drive. And yep, internally in CryEngine, we don't use any strings at all. You generate IDs from those names whenever you need them, at best, obviously, during uh, app initialization. And then over the lifetime of the application, you work only with wire IDs. So I'm going to see that in a second. How are these controls being created? We haven't touched this at all yet with Flow, but we have the single point of access, which is the audio controls editor. It's a tool in the sandbox. 
in which you create those uh, triggers, parameters, and so on. And you connect the corresponding events from the middleware to it. We will see that in a second. I think I have a screenshot right here. So this is the audio controls editor. Currently, it has the, the SDL mixer middleware loaded, the most simple middleware that we have. It's like the old school days where you had a single sound file right over here. These files are imported into your project. You have an import here, or you can drag and drop. And then you can drag and drop a sound file to the left side. That introduces, basically, the sound file to the engine, in a sense, to the game environment, right? That action automatically creates a trigger, because this guy knows I'm going to create a trigger out of a sound file. It knows there's no reason to create a parameter or a preload or whatever from it, right? And once you select it and trigger over here, and a property field will show up in the middle. I've given you some basic um, uh, means of, of uh, adjusting the sound. The volume, if it's the distance over which it should fade, right? if it should be looping or not. And if it actually starts to play or stop. Or I think even there are some more actions like pausing and resuming. So that's basically it. It's quite simple. So I have five code examples. It's really, really simple in audio. I'll just go over this real quick to explain what this is about, and then maybe we can reprogram this. So here's the uh, global functionality, right? Executing an uh, audio event on a global scale. First of all, we're going to work on this rolling ball example. I think you have seen this already. And that comes without any sound. And I just thought that's perfect. We can just put a sound on jumping the ball, right? So I uh, used a jump sound. The trigger name is jump. And we create an ID from jump trigger name. And we play it globally like that. We, hold, we, we get the audio system and tell it to execute the trigger jump ID, right? And that automatically plays the sound. That's basically it. I just put another few things here to showcase how you would then set a parameter on a global uh, level. You get the, the suppose there's a depth parameter, right? You create a depth ID and then you set the parameter globally like that. Same thing with, or I use a switch here as well. Let's say you have an alarm switch that you want to turn on and off. So you have, a, first of all, you get the ID of the alarm, and the state ID of that particular switch is on, and that's the way how you can turn it on. If you wanted to turn it off, obviously, you would then get the ID of the off state and set the alarm switch then to off. That's global functionality, not object specific. If you want to work on an object somewhere in the world, then we have a way of doing it like that. You ask the audio system to create an object for you, and you pass in the data it should use to create that object, right? This is just a debug name that is used during debugging. If you compile the engine in the release mode, this data is, uh, is thrown away because it doesn't care about it at, in release. Right? Occlusion type is something we have this direct occlusion. If a sound moves behind a wall, then there is some direct occlusion calculated. And that value is again sent to the audio designer so that they can decide what to do with the value. In this case, I turned it off. I told it to not calculate occlusion. This is the parent entity. Um, we are placing that particular object at that word position. And this was about if it should uh, assume the environment values that are at the place where it's supposed to be placed, right? I told it to ignore environments. Don't play any reverb, right? OK, we tell the audio system, hey, can you please create an object with that data? We retrieve the object. On that particular object, we play the jump ID. So now that jump sound is playing from that position in the world right, where this parent entity was. And once we are done with this particular object, we have to give it back to the system. Because this is pooled data. It's actually not really creating it. It's not really allocating memory. It's already there. There's a pool size that you can set via the receiver. And then we just uh, free it again so it can be reused by someone else. OK, that's a bit of uh, tedious work. Why do these guys then have to get an object, do something on it? Because it's really basic functionality. We, we noticed it, for instance, in heavy firefight type scenarios. They had a lot of collisions around you, like bam, 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 bam. These are all events that you, where you just create an object, you play in sound, and then you give it back to the system. And you repeat this constantly. And it, I just said, we need to automate this a bit. And that's the next step. So that's the same thing, only simpler, right? So again, you have the jump ID, a debug name, occlusion off. You place the, this uh, object at that position. Ignore this stuff again. And uh, that was the environments. And basically, you tell the audio system now, please execute that trigger with that data. And I don't care about any what you have to do internally, right? So internally, it now 
does exactly this for you. It creates an object, it executes a trigger, it places it, is, uh, it at the offset and so on. So same thing like this, only simpler. That's uh, number three, and I think that's number four or five. Executing audio events on an entity. Because now we have done globally, we have done it on an object in two different ways. And how about there are entities like um, Flo mentioned this uh, example of a dinosaur, right? So that could be an uh, entity. How would I actually make it so that I have a uh, sound event also moving with that entity? So that I don't have to take care of updating the position or the transformation of it. So let's say this MP entity is our dinosaur. Then you get or create an audio component on that particular entity. On that component, you can then execute your trigger. That would execute it on the default audio object. That component comes with a default audio object. It doesn't make any sense to create an audio component without an audio object, because obviously you want to do something with audio. So it already creates a default audio object. If you have need for another audio object, let's say these two feet and the mouth, right? Now you would have uh, need for three audio objects. This is the way of creating new audio objects on an entity. Right? We call them auxiliary audio objects. You'd set an offset to it, left foot, right foot, and then again you execute the trigger for this particular audio object that you want to address. Right? This operation returns an ID, like, hey, I created an auxiliary audio object with ID 5. This is something that we store. And later on we can say, well, on ID 5, please play jump ID or the footstep or whatever. That's it, basically, right? So audio is really meant to be kept simple. We can try and program this a bit, try it in this example here. Our goal is that designers can do all of that stuff by themselves, right? That they have all the components that they need. Like, I don't know, what is the time of day, right? So they retrieve that information from somewhere in Flowgraph or in Schematic and pass it on to audio themselves. They don't need to talk to a coder. Hey, can you please set this parameter for me, right? Or can you please execute this trigger? They can, right? There's an explosion happening somewhere. I don't know if you have seen the concept of in Flowgraph, what is it called? Those bigger events in, in Flowgraph, um, don't know, forgot the name of it. But they could use those events and just execute a trigger themselves. They already can, right? But I'm here to show you how the code below all of that looks like and how it works. Right? But honestly, I don't think you will work with code that much. You probably don't have to. But just so that you know how it works, let's uh, maybe um, try this um, example here. OK, I want to create a new project, which is the rolling ball C++ example. I'm closing the sandbox again because we don't need it just yet. Then I go reveal in Explorer. Uh, Right-click cry project file to uh, generate a solution. Okay. That created a solutions folder only for this particular game project. It doesn't um, open anything from the engine or recompile the engine. It created the game solution file, which I'm going to open here, which uh, shows a few projects. The game launcher one, if we execute that project, it just starts the pure launcher application and the editor one. If I set this to be the startup project, that should start the editor using this project. Yeah. So you have maybe heard about the possibility of creating config files for the engine that are automatically read when they boot up. So I've uh, created the user config file here and I put in the Siva s underscore draw debug. This is a Siva that you enter into the console and enables the on-screen debugging that you saw on Flo's uh, screenshots earlier. And these are different options, A, B, C, D, E, like um, show me only the object name, show me only parameters, show me only environments, show me the distance, show me whatever, switches and so on. And I just put in, combined a few options here you can look at this stuff later uh, yourself by entering in question mark after it's concessiva, it will show you all the options that you have, right? I want to copy this file into my project. Under assets, there's already an audio folder with the SDL mixer. That's the, this cost-free alternative that I talked about earlier. It contains the ACE files, audio control editor files. This is like a default setup that um, this example comes with. You can see here the default controls 
and uh, my triggers XML. Let me run the editor real quick here. Now you can see already there's debug drawing on the screen. This is because of it loaded the user config file. Shows you some general information about the system. In total, the audio system is currently occupying a kilobyte. In pools, we have allocated 400 bytes, which in total adds up to 9 kilobytes. And then we have the middleware side of it. So how much memory is actually the middleware using, right? So as, as their mixer is using 13 kilobytes, they pulled up for about 94 kilobytes, which comes to a total of 107. So that makes 115 kilobytes in total that we're currently using for audio. We have two listeners, right? The default listener that is always present and the preview listener, which is used on the audio controls editor. That preview listener is created by the audio controls editor to not interfere with sounds in the world, right? What you want to do is you have a listener that listens to the world, and then you have a listener that listens to what you do in your audio controls editor. This is some debug info. What, what we have turned on is you want to see spheres, labels, triggers, states, parameters, environment, and so on, and so on, and so on. Right? Debug filter is the name. You could say I'm only interested in controls that have the name explosion. And then this debug view would only show you uh, events of that name. Or distance. I'm only interested in events that are within like 10 meters of my position. But we have set it to infinite. We don't care. All right, under tools, you find audio controls editor. And that's how the guy looks like from the start. Over here, you see the library. We call them library, right? If you were to add something, currently you could only add a library. Let's call this jump and save. There you see the direct correlation. Default controls XML and my triggers XML. These are the two libraries. Currently, I saved, right? So I saved the jump library, but it doesn't show up over here on the left side because I don't have any data in it. We don't save anything that doesn't have anything, that doesn't come with anything. Okay, I want to import some files. And if I remember correctly, they were wave files. Here we go, yeah. Let's start with the bounce ball jump file. An import dialog pops up, which is importing it as a new file. The file doesn't exist in the project yet. And you will see, once I hit OK, it will show up on the right side of the ACE. So we imported this simple wave file. I think we should already hear it if we just double click it. Okay, now to introduce it to the engine, so we can use it, as I said, you can drag and drop it over to the library, jump here, which uh, automatically creates this trigger. The connection is over here. So in theory, you can have any number of connections here. So this one trigger could play this bounce ball file, but maybe if we set the action of the selected connection to stop, then it would stop that file, right? It would play jump, but stop this bullet impact file just to show you um, the flexibility of a trigger and how abstract this, it really is. So it doesn't mean play something, it just means do something the sound designer said, right? I'm going to remove that uh, connection again because we are only interested in the bounce ball jump. And uh, if I now double click the um, trigger, you also hear the sound file. A bit quieter because we have the volume by default at minus 14 dB. So if we just up this to zero, which is like, you know, the loudest one. It should be as loud as, as the original file. Okay, save. And we want to name the trigger for simplicity reasons, uh, just jump. Okay, double check again. That seems to play. Okay, good. I'm done here. I'm done here for now. We introduce the trigger to the project. And now we go back to our code. In the game project, there is an under components, there's a player CPP file, which is this ball, which is rolling around, I believe, right? So down here, there's a function called remote request jump on server, which is executed when you press the space bar. Remember the very first example, create an ID from jump and then simply execute it, the first two lines. Let's try that, right? So everything is Audio related in CryEngine is inside of the Cry audio namespace. In later CryEngine versions, we will have to separate it just for info. So it will look like that. But for now, in the version that you have, it's like this. We need the control ID. I call it jump ID. Inside of a Cry audio namespace, there's um, this uh, string to ID function, right? And we want to create an ID from the trigger name jump. 
second step is we ask the audio system to just execute the trigger jump ID. Now this is obviously quite slow because every time we want to play a sound we are generating an ID but we can generate that ID during boot and just store it globally, right? Because it will never change. Okay, and let's see if it compiles. Yep, look good. Let's run this. Uh, let's load the example level. I'm just gonna save this real quick here. Now I have the ball here. Right below here, you will see that the event is playing. See that? So it says that it's playing the bounce ball jump wave file on the global object. Now the problem here is we haven't told the connection that it's actually 2D sound. It thinks it's a 3D sound. So it has a fall of, one, of 100 meter. If you play a 3D sound on a global object, where do you place it? Right? We have basically the global object is hidden at the origin, 0, 0, 0. So I believe if we were to fly over there, right? Now we should probably hear it. So how do we fix that? We go back into our audio controls editor. We select our trigger jump. We select the connection, which is already selected. And we turn off panning and attenuation. That basically makes it a 2D sound. We simply save, jump back into game. And now the sound is always directly at the listener, no matter where I am. That's the most uh, simple way of playing in uh, sound in CryEngine via code. Now, we want to play it on an audio object. So we create an object, because the ultimate goal is to play it uh, at the um, ball location, right? So I think I just copy this stuff out. Now we are accessing audio data, an audio I object, which is unknown currently. For the second step, we need to include from the audio system Cry audio, the I object H file. And the jump ID, I actually generate this globally for this file, so it's globally available, right? So I can access it anywhere in any function for now. Cry audio, I prefix it with a G just to indicate it's a global variable. Jump ID equals cry audio string to ID. Okay. Okay, when I rehearsed this, I didn't need to include the audio system, but maybe we do here on these machines. Okay. By copying it from the presentation, it introduced some characters that Visual Studio cannot deal with. So I need to retype this stuff here. Right? Yeah. So now it's playing the jump sound at the position of the file, mm -hmm. right? We don't have any attenuation because it's still a 2D file. So now we can go back into the audio controls editor, jump trigger connection and reintroduce the panning and attenuation. So for audio panning means where is the sound left or right? And attenuation is basically the loss of power over distance in terms of um, decibel really, right? So we tell it that over a distance of 100 meter, it will completely lose its power. So we won't hear it anymore. That should already be it. Now, only uh, 10 meters away, right? So let's say if I set this to just for, for testing the effect, right? We are to set this to max distance of 50 meters. It should be very quiet now, right? It's a bit quieter now. Here you see the debug name that we entered into the data field, the name of the trigger that is being played currently, which is jump, and some info of um, that the distance is 12.9 meters off 15 that we set. But I'm going to set it back to 100 where it was. Okay. That concludes the example of creating an audio object, placing it at some position in the world, playing a trigger on it, and giving it back to the system. Now we go to the example where all of this is done in only two lines, just to see how this works. And here we are simply using the execute trigger X functionality. I again just copy this. I'm done with this stuff. I again need to retype this. We need to create a local variable of type trigger data. 
we pass in the ID it is supposed to trigger and then it basically repeats the debug name. We turn off occlusion. We want to place it at the position of the ball, MP entity. Get the transformation matrix. Ignore this for now and false. So that compiled all the data that we need in order to execute the trigger at some position in the world. And now we basically pass it to the audio system and tell it, hey, can you wire execute trigger X? So that compiled. So it's exactly the same thing with only two lines of code. And it's actually way more efficient because it is done in one run in the audio system or the data, right? But the sound stays at the origin. It doesn't move with the ball. Maybe we want it to move with the ball. So how do we do it? And this is where we actually need the previous example. We need to pull out the audio object because we need to reposition the audio object. We want to position it along our parent entity. And for that, because I need to be able to control the audio object across functions, I'm introducing it globally. Cry audio my object, my global object. And in initialize, I'm retrieving this object from the audio system. Create object. Now I have a valid object available. On that object, again, I want this data, right? So we retrieve that data again. And sorry, that was my mistake. Obviously, we need that at the place where we want to create audio object. Uh, oh, we don't need this anymore. Basically the same thing, we created this object globally, we have the uh, trigger available globally, but now we have the ability to control the audio object in, an, in another function, right? And I believe there is a move or something like that somewhere here. Ah yeah, here, I think this update camera. Here we could tell the audio object to reposition itself to always to the position of the entity. Let's say, get third. In theory, that should now just move the audio object along the ball. Yep. So the sound stays with the object now because it's constantly updated to the position. Of it. Now I think I'm out of time. But this is stuff that you need if you have an audio object that survives a long time and that you maybe want to set parameters on, you want to change the environment on it you want to set switches to it, maybe even play different triggers on it, then you take it out and you handle it over a longer period of time. Here it's also important, don't forget to release it again, once you're done with it, otherwise it's a leaking object. As a last example, this particular example can be done a bit simpler with less code. Here it initializes the local player and it creates component, right? And we want to create an audio component on the parent entity. It's I want to control this guy globally, so I want to make it available globally here. Now I have that component and G jump right here. Okay, we are done with the global object. Commenting it out real quick to prove that we don't use it. Now we have two lines of code asking the entity, can you create an audio component for me? And then we are just executing a trigger on that audio component. And what it already does, it moves the sound along the entity because that entity takes care of, or let's say the audio component takes care of certain functionality, right? It listens to some events of the entity. And in this instance, it's listening to the transformation changed event and moves all the audio objects along, along with it. Right? We don't need to set a name. You can see that the name is player, is player zero. That's the name they gave the ball at some point somewhere in code. So the audio object assumes the name of the owning entity that is owned by it. Now I would like to show you just the last example here with uh, creating the aux audio objects on an entity, right? How that works. You can obviously at any time look at the video later on and uh, reprogram it yourself. Um, I've done this already in preparation of this uh, meeting once. So I'm just copying the data that I I use for it and explain what I'm doing here. So globally, I'm creating an array of auxiliary IDs. I want to create, the goal is around the ball, I would like to place four additional audio objects that play some sound, right? So I'm creating an array of four IDs, 
which needs to be filled right after creating the component in initialize. So I've created the component. So basically what I'm doing, I'm iterating over this array. And for each of the entries, I'm creating an object and assign the returned ID to the object so I can later identify it. And I'm already setting an offset here. So locally, I created an array of four vectors. And I'm just placing one two meters to the left, the other one two meters to the right, the next one two meters in front of me, and the other one two meters behind me. So this is um, the four vectors that you see here, right? And this is the positioning, the offsetting of those objects. To trigger this in this example, I hijacked the keyboard functionality that I put in here. Exactly these two blocks. So I used the keys H and J. Okay, and the function is called the local player. Right, I just do it at the end here. So I'm creating a jump action. I call it shield for now, but for simplicity's sake, we just use the, the jump the jump ID. So I'm iterating over all of the aux objects and I'm executing the jump ID on all four of them. So what we should hear, it will sound weird though, because I'm going to set it to looping and then we will hear constantly boing, 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 boing on all of those four objects, right? And this is here to turn it off, to have means of controlling it, right? So ignore this. Let me delete this. So iterate over all of them and execute the jump. And in stop, one second. So that would be executing on the default object. I don't want this. And here we want to stop the trigger. In this example that I used earlier here, I actually created a trigger that stopped the sound. So I executed the trigger that stopped. Since we don't have the setup here, I'm explicitly stopping the trigger that we started before. That's the difference here really, right? I'm turning this off for the jump sound, because we want to just look at the four objects. Let's see if this compiles. Yup. All right. I'm going to set the jump sound to be looping. So it's infinitely looping now. Then it should sound like that, right? OK. Let's see how that looks like in the level. OK, so I commented the jump sound out, and, and apparently the jump action as well. So I press the H button and that happens. So it created those four auxiliary objects around the ball. And they are constantly being updated with it. Because they are just part of the entity. And now I leave that to your imagination what you can do with it. It just opens up everything, right? And stop it with J. And that concludes my small code example really for audio. I hope it wasn't too complex or too simple or too boring. <laughs> At least it all worked out. OK, Flo. The next thing will be a little more hands-on regarding the audio. And we're going to use the audio tutorial level um, as presented on the marketplace. And Dominic will run a, let's say, step-by-step -step tutorial how to, well, basically get your first sound into the engine. We're using the audio middleware FMOD Studio for that. Of course, as I mentioned, you can use ADX2 by now. You can use uh, WISE as well. It's a little bit of preference. We think that FMOD Studio is a good mix between, let's say, audio software. So you see the waveforms and it's a little bit easier to understand, while WISE is a bit more, let's say, programmer heavy from the interface. But uh, we decided to use FMOD Studio. In the end, both middlewares can do pretty much the same. It's just a matter of how they've been structured. Yes. So without further ado. So you can open the CryEngine launcher and everyone should have the audio session project in it and just left click on it. And it hopefully starts the engine, yes. And in the meantime, you can also click on the gear icon and click Reveal in Explorer. Thomas did that already, but we can have a look again on the audio controls editor. A neat feature of the engine is actually to have the search bar in the upper right. And you can just enter audio and then press enter and the audio controls editor opens. This works basically with every tool and is, is in my opinion, much faster than clicking on the tools and then selecting it. You can see on the right side, we have middleware data and in it a folder called banks. This is actually something different to the middleware we used before, SDL Mixer. In FMOD Studio and WISE and ADX2 as well, we have something called sound banks. These are basically packed assets that you use to play audio. So they are compressed, they are stored in one place, they are encrypted sometimes, and those are used by the engine to, to load into memory. 
In this case, we have a particle bank. It's not used yet, and that's not a problem because we will use it later. But on the left side, you can see um, we have different libraries. And for ordering or structuring the project, it's, it's useful to have specific libraries for specific use cases. In this case, we have a preloads library already there, and there is a particle preload. A preload you can always recognize with the blue bag. So this is, this is the icon for preload. We have other icons as well. We can see them here. A green dot is a trigger. These faders or sliders are parameter, switch, and environment. Parameter, switch, and environment are basically a way to communicate additional information from the engine to the middleware. So a parameter or a switch usu usually don't contain any audio. It's possible to do that, but they usually just are values or variables that are communicated from the engine to the audio middleware. And environments specifically are for reverbs or so. So these are communicated that way. Okay, so just as a quick overview. So you can open the project folder of the audio session and you see an underscored audio files folder above. You don't have to open it yet, but um, maybe you can open it in a different window. So we have it saved here because we need it later. And now in the first, open the assets folder, open the audio folder, and in there you see fmod underscore project and an fmod folder. In the fmod underscore project folder you have showcase underscore audio and you can open that with a double click and fmod studio should open. Okay. To quickly familiarize with the interface in FMOD, we have on the left side an events tab. This is where all audio events are, are stored and uh, saved. In the middle, we see later we have a timeline then and uh, where we can edit the audio. And in the bottom, we have the possibility to add effects or um, other information. To start, right click on the left event panel and add new event and click on new 3D event. Call it birds and press enter. Okay, so now we need the other folder you just opened, the underscore audio files folder. It's in the root folder of the CryEngine project and in there is a folder called birds. And you can select both and drag them onto the track and then release the mouse button. You should end up with something looking like this. It's called multi-instrument and it's a way for FMOD to use multiple audio assets for the same purpose. So for example, in this case, we have two variations of the same sound. It's uh, basically what Florian explained this morning, that we want to have the same effect, but we have variations of it so that it sounds more naturally. You can trigger it. It has a nice reverb, it's, it's pre-baked, so it sounds more distant. And the other one sounds similar, but different. So this is basically the first step. We added an audio asset to FMOD and created an event. Now what we have to do is first save the project so we don't lose anything when it crashes. If it crashes, it usually doesn't. Then we have to click on banks in the upper left corner. It's over here. Click on it. And then right click new bank and call it ambience. Because the bird call is part of a bigger ambience, we won't add today, but it's used there and we structure it that way. Now we have to assign the just created event to this bank. There are two ways to do it. First, I show the easier way. You right click, assign to bank and then ambience. And as soon as you do that, the hashtag unassigned behind the event name should disappear. The other way, by the way, is you grab the event, drag it onto banks, and then add it to the bank. It's possible as well, but uh, it could be complicated with bigger projects because you have a higher hierarchy. So this is the safe way, by basically. As soon as you did that, you can press F7 on the keyboard, and a short pop-up should show up, which indicates that FMOD rebuilt all sound banks, or all edited sound banks. That's currently very brief because there's only one sound. Imagine you have 20,000, then of course it will take a little longer. Exactly. <laughs> so if you now go back to the engine, you will see that we have in the banks folder a new ambience.bank. And now you can basically drag and drop it from the right side <coughs> to the preloads library and created the preload. Then save the audio controls editor, you get a pop-up message that says preload requests have been modified. 
This basically means, okay, you have added a new preload, the audio engine has to reload all data that is stored in the memory to basically play the audio that is part of this uh, sound bank. Click yes, it will save and reload the audio engine and the yellow exclamation mark on the right side should disappear. And if you open the events folder, you have the birds event and you can right click and play event and it should, it should work. This is actually a usual problem. As soon as you edit the middleware data or something in the middleware, it's important to save the middleware project because only then the CryEngine can read what is stored within the project file and show the information to you in the audio controls editor. So um, this is very important to do it. Okay, let's continue with adding the birds audio trigger. On the left side, you can add library and call it ambience as well. And then basically drag and drop the birds event onto the library and click save. And now we created our audio trigger. And you can test it and it should work. This should work for everyone because it's mostly the same as with the preload. Now you can open the file, open level and select showcase underscore audio. Now what's usually a good advice is that you create specific folders or layers in the level explorer for audio. In the bottom left I have the level explorer and I can add a new layer and call it audio and double click it. You see on the blue icon that it's active now and every asset you create or, or add to the level is stored in this layer. This is useful because usually we are quite disconnected from everything uh, the environment or level designers do. So having our own audio layer is useful for our workflow. You can click on the create object panel on audio and select audio trigger spot and basically place it in the level. Anywhere it's not that important actually. We can move it later on. And now you can just click on play trigger on the folder icon select in the ambience library birds and here's a, hear the sound. Right now this is only a one shot so it plays once usually when you enter the level but we want to have it uh, repeat over time so we click in play mode behavior and sh change single to trigger rate. The trigger rate right now is in milliseconds, so uh, a value of 1000 means that every second will be one trigger called. So we change this to 10,000 maybe. So this setting means every 1 to 10 seconds will a trigger be called, basically. A common problem was that we added the audio trigger spot, but it's placed anywhere in the level, but not there where we want it. So you can activate the toggle snapping to geometry so that meshes and brushes will also get recognized by clicking on it. For instance, in that case, the audio trigger spot isn't placed 1000 meters away there where the terrain starts, but actually there where we look at it, which is quite useful, <laughs> obviously. So we can debug a bit because uh, mistakes always happen so we can check where it comes from. The most important debug SIVA we have is S underscore draw debug. You can press tab to automatically fill it and then enter a question mark. And now you get a massive spam <laughs> of possible letters to enter after the SIVA. Uh, with different information. For example, A adds a red sphere around the audio trigger to see where it comes from, where it plays. B adds a text label for the active audio object, so you see the event name. C is the actual trigger name and, and, and so on. We have everything you ever thought of debugging is in this SIVA basically. So in this, I, I really like A, C and G because the usual stuff you want to know is what is playing, where it is playing and how far am I away because sounds change over distance. So if you activate this, the first thing you will see is you get this debug draw on the left corner. You see which uh, middleware is active, in this case it's FMOD Studio and you see the system version, it's 2.00.04. This is actually a good uh, way to check which FMOD version you have to download. So open the engine, enter the SIVA, enter the SIVA for activating the right middleware and you can check what uh, current middleware implementation is active and uh, which middleware you have to use. 
Then you see the position of the listener, but the most important information is with the audio trigger spot that is not active right now. You get the red dot, the in distance and the event name. So S underscore draw debug is the receiver for this. We will add now a sound to the fire particle we see in the middle of the map. It's placed over here and you can hear there is currently no sound at all. So first step is back to F mod and open the asset bin. I already added the audio assets to FMOD, but we don't have an event for it. So FMOD has an internal place where it saves the asset. <laughs> and we can access it by clicking on window and selecting audio bin or use the shortcut control 3. And there you can see in the particle folder we have five particle sounds. These are all variations of the same sound and should be used in one event. So we select all five of them drag and drop it to the left, release it, and then we get a prompt where we can select, okay, we want to create a 3D event. 2D event doesn't make sense because we want to hear where the fire is coming from, so selecting 3D event, and we want to say, create a new event with one multi-instrument. This means we have, in the end, we have one event, we have one multi-instrument with all five assets in it. Click on create, name the event fire underscore particle, you can close the audio bin and then you see we have one massive multi-instrument. So this is good, but we have one major problem. The sound stops after 15 seconds and the fire is continuously burning. So we have to add a loop region for this. So to do this, right click on it and then select new loop region. And what happens is that FMOD automatically creates a loop region for the length of this multi-instrument. But if you now scroll in at the end of the in instrument, you can see that one file is actually shorter than the others. So the event structure of FMOD is usually linear. So you have a timeline on top and this is where the time is basically counted. And if you select the multi-instrument now, you see you have on the bottom left an async button. This deactivates this linear timeline, but activates a non-linear playback of the audio asset. So it will always play the sound till the end, no matter how stretched this multi-instrument is, for example. So you can see this here. The big locator moves faster than the small locator within the instrument. So if we now stretch it to the length of the loop region, we can see it just jumps back and the multi-instrument will continue playing the sound. Wait, give me a second. The missing part was you not only have to have activate the async button, but also click on the loop button within the multi-instrument. Dominic, what happens if we deleted the stuff from the bin? That's a problem, because it's not on the hard drive. So now you can continue to add the fire particle to a bank. Again, right click, assign to bank. Uh, or you may need to create a new bank as well, a new um, particle bank, but I think some of you already have it. So first create a new bank, which is called particle, then go back to, to your events, right click on the fire particle and assign it to the new created particle bank. Okay, so in the banks tab you can now see fire particle, the event is part of this bank. Save the project and press F7 to rebuild it. And now in the audio controls editor, you can see within the banks folder on the right side, we have the particle.bank. And in the events folder, we have fire underscore particle. Some of you may have the particle library in the, on the left side already. I deleted it yesterday for some of you in the FMOD project. So we can see what happens if the trigger is still active in the engine, but not in FMOD. So you can see we still have the trigger even if no audio is connected and it's indicated by the red exclamation mark. We can still use this trigger anywhere, it will just won't play any audio. So for example, if your programmer wants to implement a sound or your um, particle guy wants to create a, add a sound to a particle, you just can create a, an, an, an ace trigger for it without even having the sound 
saving the library, sending it over. The trigger is there and it's ready to implement, but you obviously won't hear anything, but it's completely independent from another. So what we can do now is select the trigger on the left side and right click the stuff in the middle and click remove connection. This is basically the old file name or the old event name and you click yes. Now you can select the trigger on the left again and just drop the fire underscore particle in the middle of it and you can see the floating text says connect to and then you drop it and you see okay the connection is there like with the other trigger. Save it again, reload the audio engine and then you are ready to go to the particle editor. And in the hamburger menu you can select file, uh, open and then select the fire particle. So we can continue to add the uh, default audio component. So you can right click on the light grey pane, select default and then select audio. If you click now on audio trigger, the purple one, and you see the controls for it on the left side. In the play trigger section add the audio trigger. And now again with the uh, UI bug that uh, Victor me mentioned yesterday, if you click away and click again on the audio trigger, you will see additional checkboxes. We have to activate those. Follow, follow particle means that if you move the particle around, the audio proxy or the audio uh, sound will move with the particle. And stop on death means if the parent, the particle dies, audio dies as well. This is important and in the lifetime menu, um, you can deactivate lifetime. This means we want the sound to play infinitely, so we deactivate the lifetime so it plays forever, basically, until the particle dies. Um, you can now save, hamburger menu, file, save. Then deactivate and reactivate the active checkbox on the right side. To this point, we did basically two times the same. We added a trigger to the CryEngine and triggered it somewhere. Either in the particle or in the audio trigger spot, you saw it's basically the same. So the system you use is usually uh, no big difference for the audio guys. You just add an audio trigger to it and then it plays <coughs> this stuff. For example, in the character tool it's the same. You have to create the anime events file and add the audio trigger to it. But basically it's the same, just with a different tool. But the interesting part now is that it, it does matter how far away we are from the audio event. You can hear that. If I'm closer, it's louder. If I'm further away, it's quieter. Why does this happen? In FMOD you can see if you select the fire particle event and then click on the master track. You can see that we have an effect added on the bottom which is called spatializer. And this effect is responsible for attenuating the sound over distance. Attenuating simply means in this case it gets quieter if we are further away. You can set the min and max distance for this. So, for example, in this case, now we hear it over 100 meters. If I quickly rebuild and re-enter the engine, reload the sound banks, you can hear it, okay. 30 meter, 40 meter, 50 meter, 60, 70, 80, and now it's gone. So, the spatializer is responsible for attenuating the sound over distance, but we have very limited control over it. We basically can say, okay, which curve do you use? We can choose between four different curves or none and that's basically it and usually that's not enough. So what we need for games at least is having a parameter control volume and filtering of the audio asset. How we achieve this is by clicking on the plus icon over here. You can see okay I could add a parameter now but we don't have a parameter currently so we can click on new parameter and this parameter could basically be everything. It's like in the slide this morning from Flo, player health, player win counter, how long he plays, whatever. But in this case we want it to be named distance with a range from 0 to 1. And parameter type on top, click built in distance. So FMOD has an own function for this because distance is such a usual parameter, uh, we can just add it. Oh, and we have to add a new range, so we say, okay, over 150 meters maybe in this case. And then you can click on OK. You can see, okay, we have a new timeline over here. It starts at zero and ends at 150. We now have a parameter, but we, this parameter does nothing, basically. 
we have to add a filter, for example. So what should happen is I get away from the sound, the sound loses high frequencies. So we have to add an effect to, for this and in the, if you click again on the master track and then on the bottom you can see click to add a pre-fader effect. We click on that, say add effect and then fmod multiband EQ. We add it and we can see, okay, I won't go into details about audio engineering or so, it, we can talk about that for months, but we basically see, okay, on the left side we have low frequencies, on the right side we have high frequencies and the red line is basically our filter. So what we can do is, if we move it to the left, we lose high frequencies. If we move it to the right, we restore them. So we, we don't add anything, we just don't cut them. So this is called a low pass filter or a high cut filter. It's basically the same but a different name. We want to control the frequency over distance. So on the right side, if you select the A filter, so if you move this around, you can see, okay, if I move it to the left, this number decreases. We can move it like this as well. And if you right click on this number, you have an option called add automation. A new window opens and you can say add curve, browse, and then we have the distance parameter. So right click on the frequency, add automation, then add curve, browse, distance. Okay you can see that on the master track we now have a new track which is called multiband EQ and it controls the parameter frequency dot A and the red dotted line. This means the parameter currently does nothing because we haven't added any points to this line. So if you click on one, you can see, okay, the dotted line is now a constant and we add a first point at zero at 22 kilohertz and we don't want to hear the sound at maybe 60 meters, almost not anymore. So at a point at zero with 22 kilohertz and at 60 with maybe 450 hertz. You can change the curve by clicking on this red dot and it smooths the frequency change over distance. If you save now and press F7, and go back to the engine and reload the audio engine by clicking on this button in the upper part, in the toolbar. It's called Refresh Audio and reactivate the particle, in my case. You can hear we have high frequencies. We lose high frequencies over distance. It's a bit extreme in this case, but it shows the purpose. To make it more obvious, you can deactivate the curve on the spatializer. So the volume doesn't change in this case, but you can hear the frequency modulation. You can do the same with volume. And this is actually useful because uh, usually you want to have more control over how the volume changes over distance. So it's the same if you click on the master bus and right click on the 0 dB slider. You have the same context menu and click again on add automation. And you see, okay, automation was automatically added. You can create a new point at 0 dB and another at 60, yeah, at 60 meters distance, maybe with minus infinity, and maybe something like this. So we have a quick decrease in volume over three meters, but then have a relative long decrease with a relative slow curve. Rebuild the sound bank, reload the engine, we can listen to it. And you can even jump into the game. Yeah, unfortunately we have to stop at this point. So that was just a brief overview about how to get, let's say, your first sound into the engine. Obviously that's only chapter one. one? Yes. <laughs> so under documentation in the CryEngine section you find a step-by-step -step detail of what we just did. At the same time, also chapter two, three, and more to come up, I guess, once we're ready with it. You can see it here, bringing sound into the engine. So that's what we basically did, the first chapter. And then it also talks about areas, ambiences, how we do environments, how you nest your environment. So for example, you have a hut in a forest. What do you want? You want the forest. You don't want the forest inside the hut, right? 
So, and all these, let's say, little tricks. Uh, same for audio for particles, what we touched on, and dynamic ambiences. And the same goes as we've spent quite some time in FMOD Studio as well, which is another software to learn. If you go to the web pages of the audio middlewares, like FMOD and WISE and ADX2, they have plenty of tutorial videos how to work with the actual audio middleware. And this is very straightforward. They do a step-by-step -step thing as well. So with both information from our documentation in combination with the how to use FMOD, for example, you should have a pretty good idea. Okay, yeah, thank you so much for your time and attention. Hope you make some awesome sounding product.